warnings. So I was standing on the cliff, literal cliff in this case, and I'm in college. I went to UMD, and um, I had a really bad habit of jumping off tall things into water. <clears throat> things I would punish my kids for today if they did this. And the people around me were saying, I don't think you should jump, man. I mean, we jumped in some stupid places. There was one place we jumped where the instructions you gave new people is, all you need to do is clear the first level of rock. So that's the kind of places we jump into. And so, so I'm there, and I'm at Gooseberry Falls, if you know where that is on the North Shore. And uh, we had swum in different parts of the pools before, but it was the main pool, and it had just had a downpour of rain. So the water was churning and moving and shining. I said, this is going to be amazing, epic. I probably didn't say epic, but then we said something like choice or cool. Uh, this is going to be something like that really good. And so um, I did. I jumped in, and I remember going under twirling and then coming up way down there and going really fast, going around the corner. I distinctly remember being amazed how fast I was going and then thinking the falls are coming up. And uh, I did. I got to the side. I climbed up. And I remember going up the hill and drying off. And uh, one of my friends pointed out this huge, like, stone plaque that was there that said, don't swim here, dummy, basically. And it, it literally then had the list of names of people who had been killed swimming there. And so all of a sudden, it wasn't as funny, it wasn't as cool. Warnings. Do we pay attention to warnings? Are you the person who they have warnings on the wall at work? You're the reason they have those? I mean, do, 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 do you ignore them? And, and so, so here's, the, here's the thing. We're about to look at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, and Jesus ends the Sermon on the Mount with three passages that are about a warning. And, and this is not just a warning that, hey, if you do this, it won't be good, or this is going to mess up your earth or your life. Th th these are warnings with eternal consequences. And, and I should just let you know, the passages we're going to be looking at over these next couple of weeks, they're, they're so out of step with our, our culture, because our culture is all about inclusion. Everybody's good, everybody's good, you're, I'm good, I'm good, it's all good. It's very soft, very warm, and we feel like that's loving, okay? This passage, these passages are going to kind of punch that in the nose, because Whereas our culture currently has changed from an emphasis where we're emphasizing equality. What equality is, is everybody gets a shot. Everybody has the same opportunity. Everybody can. Christian is all about equality. It's about inclusion. It says, whosoever will can come. They've changed equality to equity. What equity means is that everybody gets to the same place at the end. And so if everybody's doing the same thing, it's not fair, it's not just whatever, no matter what choices were made along the way, well, Christianity teaches equality. And, and, and Jesus is all about this thing of saying, I'm going to give you all opportunity, and I'm going to give you all a choice. But understand, the choice has consequences. Now, to kind of understand this, I want to kind of set this up by describing three different people who have three different relationships to Christianity. Two that I want to suggest to you are, are profoundly missing the point. And the third, which, which will help us understand the heart of these passages we're about to look at. So, so the first person I would describe uh, when we look at this, by the way, these are, these, are the, these are the illustrations Jesus uses at the end of the Sermon on the Mount. Again, we're in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus' ethical teaching, the fact that he ends it with three illustrations that are all warning about the same thing from slightly different aspects should tell us. That he gave us three warning passages at the end of his ethical teaching. So Jesus is not saying, listen, what I'm saying here is, you know, just a good idea, and it's one of many good ideas. Try it, see if it works. Jesus is actually saying, listen, if you don't pay attention to what I just said, the consequences are absolutely dire, not just for this life, but for eternal life. And so, so he uses the illustration of a gate, a tree, and a house on a rock. So, so before we, we unpack this, let me just show you three different people. The first is what I call a Christian non-Christian. So what's a Christian non-Christian? A Christian non-Christian is a person who claims belief in Jesus Christ, but does not follow his ethical teachings or example. 
So this is everything the Sermon on the Mount is warning about. It's the hypocritical te- Christian. It's the words-only Christian. It's the Christian who thinks that if I just believe the right things, say the right creeds, if I prayed that prayer at the end of that service, if I've asked Jesus in my heart, if I've been confirmed, if I've had communion, if I've done all the religious obligations, I'm good. For them, Christianity is a checkbox. It's a fire insurance. It's a get-out-of-hell-free card. Now, now, a lot of times these people go to church all the time time. They advocate for Christian causes. They have a fish on the back of their car. Okay. My apologies if this is not you and you have a fish, but these people have a fish at the end uh, at back of their car. These are people who profess all the right things. So they declare they're a Christian, but their life is completely inconsistent with holiness, with growth. They don't turn the other cheek. They don't love their neighbor as themselves. They don't go the extra mile. They don't forgive. They don't bless their enemies, do good to those who persecute them. They don't even think about what that would look like. They are not growing in reality of living and loving Christ. The actions are not in line with what they claim they believe. Now again, all of the Sermon on the Mount should be understood as Hebraic wisdom literature. That is to say, this is about how to live a wise life, a good life, a life that is worth living. And, and here's the thing you just really need to understand about Hebraic wisdom poetry. For, for, for people, I've said this so many times, please hear me, that for, for, for them, wisdom was not about what you know or what you assent to or what you intellectually click. Wisdom is what you do. You are not wise till what you believe articulates itself into how you live. And and so the person who claims to be a Christian but is inconsistent uh, in in their whole life, um, they're, they're the kind of person who says, you know what, I'm glad Jesus came to give me life. But let me have to just explain something to you. Jesus did not come to live, die, and rise from the dead to give you life. He did not. He came to be your life. He came to be your life. And if you've got a little Jesus on the side and then the rest of your life, you may want to really listen to these warning passages we are about to listen to. You know what it's like? It's the person who orders a 32-ounce steak with a salad. (laughs) Jesus is the salad. We don't really want it. We got it on the side. We think it's good for us. Okay, it's going to soak up the calories from the steak, right? Or something like that. But the truth is, They're living with Jesus on the side. So that's the first example, okay? The second is the non-Christian Christian, Christian, okay? So this is the person who, who, let me just read it, a person who denies or is indifferent to belief in Jesus Christ, but lives by much of the ethic and the example of Jesus Christ. So these are the people who do, they actually do a lot of turning the other cheeks. They go the extra mile. They volunteer, super nice, mow their lawn, pay their taxes. They live by a lot of Christian principles, but they would either be, you know, meh, or actually offended if you suggested that they were Christians. They don't have a relationship with Christ. They don't profess Christ. They don't understand where their morality and ethic come from. Now, these people just befuddle us, don't they? Because we as Christians, I had some neighbors in a house I used to live in, nicest people ever, kind, considerate. Something happened to one of our kids, they'd call, they'd check in, they'd help out. They were awesome people. And I remember thinking, I wish the people who went to our church were this good. Not you, those other people at that time, where they were terrible. And so, so the, the point is, is, that, is that, that we look at that and say, where does that come from? Well, here's one of the things you need to understand. This is what these, these folks also don't understand, is that the teaching of Jesus came into the world 2,000 years ago. And it's been impacting, particularly Western culture, for 2,000 years. So many of these things that they do, they do because... Of Christ. You don't even realize it. So, so if you were to ask these people, and I have, I said, why do you do the right things? What are you doing? He says, I don't know. I was just raised that way. Or I just want to be a good person. Or we just want to do good things. And if you ask them, well, how do you know those are good things? And where does that come from? They go, what now? And, and, and so what I want to show them is that these ideas came into the world with Jesus Christ. And somewhere along the line, those Ethics got cut off from the person of Christ. So you actually are a non-Christian Christian. That is to say, you are a person who does a lot of the Christian stuff, but you don't know Christ. You don't have a relationship with Christ. And, and the problem with that is that not only do, do we miss the most important thing, the person of Christ. But when we break it away from Christ and his word, the further we get from that, the more we tweak it, we change it, and it becomes something else that actually seems to be good, healthy, and nice, but actually isn't in in life. Some of you may be experiencing that here coming to Jacob's Well. 
I mean, you may come to Jacob's Well and say, you know, this place really has changed the way I live. I went to this emotionally healthy relationship thing, learned a ton about relationships, and that's actually producing good things in your life. You may come to Financial Peace University, and you may apply those financial principles, and you may, man, this has really helped. Our finances are so much better. And so you're reaping the fruit of doing things Jesus' way, but you have never found Jesus. And if you are in that situation you should really pay attention to these warning passages because they have something similar to you. Now, the third choice, of course, is the Christian Christian. This is a radically different thing. This is a person who has a love relationship with Jesus that, complete, that is currently completely changing them and naturally lead to following Jesus' ethics and example. So this is a person who has met Jesus. They recognized that their life was broken. They needed God. They could not do it for themselves. There's something bigger than them. They've sinned. They need forgiveness. They need mercy. And they found Jesus. And they found Jesus. They fell in love with Jesus. And they started following Jesus. And he changed them. And he is changing the way they think, what they care about, how they act. They, they allow Jesus' teaching to have authority over their life. So what Jesus says is what they want to do, what they want to think, how they want to be. And this is changing. Now, these are not perfect. Perfect people, not even sometimes super religious people in, in terms of religiosity and churchy stuff, but these are people who have been and are being radically changed because they're in relation with Christ. They are not, listen now, just believers in Jesus intellectually. They are actually followers of Jesus in thought, action, behavior, and relationship. So what they do is an outflow of what they believe. This is a Christian Christian. This is the kingdom of God. This is what Jesus called us to. I just want to say something here that's kind of a blinding flash of the obvious, but it's super important that we all understand this. I'm actually of the belief that many, many people who think they're on their way to heaven are not. Many people who think that they're on the way to the kingdom of God, the way to eternal life, are not. Because they're either people who have professed it without any true transformation, so they're both the idea of Jesus without the action of Jesus, or people who are wanting the good fruit in this life of doing christian -y things, but they have never had a love relation with Jesus Christ that will not only change them in this life, but for eternity. So these passages are warning about these phenomenon in our lives as followers of Jesus Christ. This is why the vision of Jacob's Well is so important. So this has been our vision for over 20 years. People say, what are they trying to do to you at Jacob's Well? This. This is what we're trying to do to you, okay? And it starts with glorious inclusion, glorious equity, glorious just everybody, wherever you are in your journey, and whoever you are, and whatever you've done, if you're a church, if you're not church, if you're male or you're female, if you're black or you're white, if you're from... Uh, far away or close, if you've been a really profound, extra-achieving sinner, or you've been kind of the sneaky kind of religious sinner, you know, kind of, you, you've got whatever your version of sin is, whatever your brokenness is, wherever you are in your journey, if you fully believe in Jesus, if you're not even sure if God exists, wherever you're at, that's the opportunity, that's the inclusion, that's the openness, that's what loving inclusion looks like, okay? But it does not look like saying, you know what, wherever you're in your journey, that's fine. Just stay there. You're going to be fine. I'm going to be fine. I won't judge you. It's just all good. Because that's not where it stops. Because love says, you know what we're going to do? We're going to start a journey. We're going to take steps, okay? Not one big moment, not one big decision, not one big commitment, but a million little steps in the right direction. That's how change happens, by the way. It's momentum in the right direction. That's all change. And so we're going to take steps. We're going to do it together. Okay, we're going to do it. We're going to learn how to love each other and be a relationship. And what's our goal? Look at this now. To know and become like Jesus. And so we're going to talk about a love relationship with a God who so loved the world, he sent his son. But then we're going to be followers of Jesus who take his commands seriously, who seek to live like him so that we look like what we claim to believe. And so we're trying to know and become like Jesus. This is the kingdom of God. This is what it means to be a Christian. It's what the Apostle Paul said in another place in Philippians. He said, we are working out our salvation with fear and trembling. So we have the salvation. We're working it out. And how is that possible? He goes on to say, for it is God who works in us. And so because we live in this relationship... We walk in a different way. This is what the warning passages at the end of the Sermon on the Mount are all about. So let's talk about a gate, a tree, 
and a house. The first one is a gate. This starts with a path or a gate. He said, enter by the narrow way or by the narrow gate. For the gate is wide and it is easy that leads to destruction. Now, I want to point out a couple of things about all three of these different illustrations because they really are all trying to make the same point with slightly different points of application. Is that what is very, very clear here is a dichotomy. That is to say, two pathways. So there's a wide road, a narrow road. There's bad fruit, there's good fruit. There's a house built by a wise person, there's a house built by a foolish person. There's no ambiguity. There's no, you know what, there's some good, there's some bad, all this good. Jesus, listen, when, when the stakes are this high, what you want is clarity, okay? If you came running up to me and said, I need directions to the hospital now, and I were to say to you, you know what, all roads lead to the hospital. I don't want to judge your path and your truth about how to get to the hospital. Okay, you know what? Some roads, you know, some people say this is the hospital. What is a hospital anyway? You know, if I got all into that, you know, I love you, man. And so I don't want to make you feel bad about maybe choosing a way to the hospital that wouldn't be the way I would choose the hospital. Okay? When the stakes are that high, you need me to say, come on, I'm driving. I'll bring you to the hospital because there's really, like, this is the way. Because we got to get there. Because the stakes are just that high. And so, so, so th this comes with incredible clarity about the dichotomy. It also comes with incredible clarity about, about the stakes. Because you're going to see, you know, in a minute here, this road leads to destruction. This, this, this fruit gets cut down and burned. This bad tree, this house falls with a great crash, okay? Very clear, okay, that one way leads to life, the other way, one way leads to life, one leads to destruction. Destruction, incredibly clear about that. And, and just to understand that ultimately, all three of these are gonna have a special emphasis on the actions, listen now, that are evidence of the relationship. Did you just hear what I said? Actions, what we do that are evidence that Jesus Christ is real in your life and that there is a change that is taking place. Now, I'm not talking about perfection. I'm not talking about struggling. I'm not even talking about deep strugglings and addicts and all those kinds of things like that. There's some deep struggles, but that something has happened in the person of Jesus Christ that I am not what I was. I am not what I will be, but I'm on a journey and I am moving towards life because I'm living in a relationship with Jesus Christ. So all of these are gonna have a special emphasis on looking at the fruit as indication of life. So he says, enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and easy that leads to destruction, and those who enter it are many. And so that's the nature of all change, by the way. All change, you know, uh, things that lead to destruction, whether well, you're talking about uh, uh, drugs, or you're talking about immorality, or you're talking about having an affair, or anything like that, or, 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 or financial mismanagement. When you start, doing the wrong thing feels awesome. It's easy, a lot of people doing it, okay? But it leads to destruction. And Jesus says, if you ignore that principle in life, you're gonna be just in a cycle of self-sabotage. He said, but real change, and particularly spiritual change, starts with the narrow. Few people choose to do the hard things, okay? Few people choose to, to go the extra mile, overcome in that way. He says it starts hard, but it leads to life. You become something significant, strong enough to go on that journey. He said, that is my way. That's why he goes on, verse 14. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. See, th this is one of the reasons I don't believe in that thing where people, I've had so many people who just want to be, they're kind of universalists, they just want to include everybody. They say, oh, Paul, all the roads lead to the top of the mountain. All the ways are equally justified and equally good. I just want to say, and I have said, that that's not true about almost any aspect of life. So, so for instance, if I say, you know what, I want to be healthy. And all roads lead to health. So I'm going to do the monster buffet, hot dog, ice cream, no exercise diet. And I believe that's going to lead me to life. You're going to say that's nonsense. You say, I'm going to do finances. You say, I'm going to do the shop a lot, overextend myself, take a lot of debt on, totally irresponsible spending, and that's going to lead me to financial life, financial prosperity. It doesn't work. So if we say, you know what, I'm going to do whatever feels fit my true spirituality and say, you know, it's just, it's just up to me. It's not based on anything other than my opinion or my whim at my time. 
We wouldn't think that that's going to lead to life. I'm going to end up in a very, very bad place. And so he says, the path you choose leads somewhere. Now, it doesn't matter if you don't want it to lead there. It doesn't matter if you don't feel like it should lead there. It doesn't matter if you don't think it's fair or nobody told me or my parents or whatever. The path you're on is leading somewhere. And if it's the path that Jesus laid out, his way, his life, relationship with him, it leads to life. The other paths lead to destruction. He could not be more clear here. Second illustration, he talks about a fruitful life. Now, I'm only going to touch on this because I'm going to unpack this more deeply next week because what we're going to see is the aspect that he really teaches on here in this aspect has to do with those wicked people who will come and they will take the life of Jesus, the example of Jesus, the teaching of Jesus, and they will twist it to hurt and manipulate people as false teachers. That's what he calls wolves in sheep's clothing. So very, even as Jesus is teaching his way, he's saying, now just understand, there's some people who are going to really use this in a really evil, creepy, horrible way, and he's going to tell us how to identify them. Okay? Spoiler alert, he says you're going to know them by their fruit. So he uses this illustration, again, to bring that point out. But again, for our purposes, again, clear dichotomy. One leads to destruction, one leads to life. He says, every tree that does not bear good fruit, he says, is cut down, thrown into the fire. Okay? If you want to see an expanded conversation of this, read John 15 about the vine and the branches. Because Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. Any branch that stays connected to me will bear much fruit. Without me, you can do nothing. Now that doesn't sound soft. That sounds clear. He says, any branch that bears fruit, he says, I prune that. So it becomes more fruitful. He says, any branches that don't produce fruit, I cut off. They're thrown into the fire and they're burned. So these, may, these, these branches may have lots of leaves. They may look religious. They may have a good show. But he says, the fruit in your life matters. Now, now we're good at, at doing two things. One, inspecting other people's fruit, which we should not do. Holy Spirit's job, you're not qualified to judge another person. The other thing is, we love to, to tape wax fruit on our trees. Okay? So, well, well, look, I go to church. Oh, look, I'm religious. Oh, look, I believe the right thing. Look, I've got a, a Jesus flag and a Jesus sticker, and I've got the right things, and I've got the right, you know, put picture on my Facebook. I have all the externals, and I call that fruit. Look how serious I am. Look at all the, the, the messages I'm saying that I believe the right things. For Jesus, he defined fruit that only comes through the Spirit, a relationship with the Holy Spirit, who is the Spirit of Jesus, he says, when the fruit of the Spirit are things that you can't produce, they overflow from the relationship you have with Jesus. He says the fruit of the Spirit are things like love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, goodness, self-control. He says against such things you don't even need rules. When you're living in a love relationship with Jesus Christ and he changes you from the inside out, the, the change is the fruit that is produced. And so this idea that, that we're meant to be fruitful is that we're meant to love each other and have peace with each other. It's the Sermon on the Mount, okay? And so, so what Jesus is saying is that if you're not fruitful, okay, you might either be that Christian on Christian or the non-Christian Christian. He says, first I start by pruning so that the fruit can start to grow. But if it becomes just an empty leafy branch, it just gets cut off from the vine. He says, thus you will recognize them by their fruits. Now the third illustration is building something that stands for a test. This is two builders, okay? Two builders come along, one is wise, one is foolish. The wise one comes along and says, we're going to need a good foundation. Solid here, going to build on the rock. The other person says, look at the beach, wonderful. Lots of sand, open space, no one's taking this spot, we'll put the house here, Okay? One is wise, one is foolish. Everyone then, listen now. Now, a couple things I want to point out about this specific illustration. First of all, both builders hear the words of Jesus. Okay? They've heard it. They know it. They may even profess to believe it. They may show up at church. They, they may have memorized it. They both have heard it. And by the way, for some of you, I may have done you a bit of a disservice here today. Because after today, you will have heard and now you're accountable. You have a choice to make. So at the judgment, and there is a judgment, where your fruit will be looked at as evidence of the relationship, okay? Okay? And, and part of the evidence will be, well, you heard it. You had a choice. And you stood there, you got mad, you said, no way, you found an excuse, you blew it off, you hardened your heart, okay? So, so both heard it. The other thing I want you to notice is that both went through storms. Both experienced flooding, 
Wind, rain, difficulty. See, this is one of the big myths about Christianity. Some people sign up for Christianity because they believe it's a get me out of problem card. You know, uh, it's going to protect my life. My life's going to be great. I'll be healthy, wealthy, whatever. You know, things will be easier. Just so you know, sometimes following Jesus makes your life more difficult. Actually, it usually does because now you're adding persecution to what everybody else has to go through. Okay, it's a costly thing, but it transforms trials. We're going to see this in just a minute. It transforms trials into something God can use. So both heard, both went through it. One stands, one falls in, in a heap. Okay, so, so look what he says. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does them and does them and does them. So what is he talking about? Everything he just said in the Sermon on the Mount. He, he is a person who does not take advantage of each other. This is a person who forgives. They let their yes be yes. They keep their word. This is a person who turns the other cheek, goes the extra mile, starts with the log in their own eye, and struggles to figure out how to apply them in their life because this is Jesus' way. This is a person who's building their life on Jesus in relationship and Jesus' way. Okay? So this is a person who does them. Look at this. Will be like the wise person who built their house on a solid foundation. So Jesus is saying, listen, my way is the foundation. My person, my example, my teaching. Now notice he's never going to say, you know what? My way is an excellent option. A lot of good ideas out there. Try this one. Jesus is never going to say that. He is, he, is, he is incredibly clear about this. He says, listen, I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. He says, another place, the scripture says, there's one name given among men by which men may be saved, the name Christ Jesus. So Jesus is incredibly clear. My way is the right way. And the more you align yourself with my way, the more your life is going to be something solid. The more you're going to become a significant person, a strong person, a growing person. So he goes on, he says, verse 25, and the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew. So that again, Christianity is not a a, a trick to make this life better. Now, I do believe following Christ does make this life better, but some aspects make it harder and more difficult and costly as well. But that, we're going to see in a minute, God, God uses to make things better. It, it's, he turns trials into gold. It's the most beautiful, powerful thing. And so, so, so if you've signed up for the Jesus make my life better now plan, that's not the gospel. The gospel is a transformation through a relationship that transforms this life and the life to come. We become heavenly minded in such a way that we live in an earthly good way. Everybody's going to go through the wind, the floods, the storm. The question is, what is your life built on? Okay, Jesus' teaching, Jesus' way, Jesus' example, relationship with Jesus, or something else. And the winds blew and beat in the house, but it did not fall. Look at this. Because it had been founded on the rock. What's the rock? Jesus is teaching. The Sermon on the Mount. Everything we've been saying. So this is not just good idea to pep you up. This is what you build your life on. Again, Jesus did not come to give you life. He came to be your life. Okay? He will never be satisfied with simply giving you life. So that you can go do other things. Okay? So you can give your life and your love and your affections to some other thing, some other, some other guy, idol. That would be like a spouse giving you a ride to have an affair. See what I'm saying? So Jesus satisfies with only you, uh, only your life. So the, what's he want? Well, he wants everything. Look at the other example. And everyone, so notice just everyone. This is all open to everyone. Here's the choice, okay? And this is the way it always is. And everyone who hears these words of mine, so they heard again, and does not do them will be like the foolish person who built their house on the sand. No foundation. So what does that look like? My opinion, my feelings, my reality, what I think, what I want, how I want to define things, this philosophy, this philosophy, this smart person, that smart person, this ideology, this idea, those are, that's just all sand. You know, and hey, listen, this is my truth and my great. That's awesome until the rain comes and the flood comes and the fires burn and the difficulties come, okay? That's how long it lasts. You see, here's one of the things I know. I'm not smart enough to build my own foundation. I'm not in tune enough with the way things really are. I have way high capacity for self-deception. 
to tell myself what I want to hear. I need something outside myself to say, no, this is the place to stand. This is the way you do it. This is the truth. And this is who you are. I don't even define myself. The idea of choosing who I'm going to be is nonsense to me. I get all of that from Jesus. He shows me who he is because he's not simply giving me life. He is my life. He is my life. And so, 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 again, these are people who are building on sand. Verse 27, the rain fell, yep, floods came, that's life, and winds blow, gonna happen, and beat against the house. Anybody feel like they've been beat, beat lately? So, so he beat against the house, and it fell. Look at this next part. And great was the fall of it. So this is the person who said, you know, I got my plan, my thing, my dreams, my all things, it's gonna be my worldview, and then life hit, and all of a sudden there's no meaning, there's no hope, it falls apart, our plans to just crash, or worse, I got everything the world gave me and it's just not enough. This is not enough. It's been about me, it's all about, and it's just not enough. That's a life that crashes. You know what else happens is that when those, those two builders are in the same storm, you know what? And, and the one who sees everything crash is kind of laying in the, the rubble, and the person over who said, that was a bad storm, I don't think we're gonna make it, but here we are, we're still standing. You know what? I'm gonna stay where I'm at. And that's how God uses charge trials to transform. We're going to see this when we study the book of 1 Peter. We're going to do that this summer. 1 Peter is all about trials. And one of the things it says about trials is that God takes our trials and he validates our faith with trials. That is to say, he shows your faith is real. So like, if you were to build a boat, I had a son who built a boat, he built a boat. The first time we floated, we sent it in the water to float, we're like, is this going to float? We probably could have played in safe said, we're never going to put it in the water. What if it sinks? No, no, no. You build a boat to float a boat. And, and so if you're building your life, God sends trials, and what it does is it shows that your faith is real, your strength is real. It makes you a more significant person. And then when you get through the trial, the really bad trials, and you're still standing on the rock, your faith then becomes something more precious, more important, more real. And when that happens, you gain assurance. One of the ways you get assurance that your salvation and your faith is real is by going through trials and still being on the other side. And so, so this person who goes from it sees it and they look at what the rest of the world is doing and just what's falling apart in their life and saying, I'm not building on that. And then they see the same person building on the same sand over and over again and say, whatever, I'm standing on the rock. I'm standing on the rock. One of my heroes is a fellow by the name of Wilbur, William Wilberforce, and he should be everybody's hero. He was a great British politician who changed the mind of a nation about the issue of slavery back several hundred years ago. Um, he was the one who uh, led the movement over decades to end slavery in all of Great Britain. When we say all of Great Britain, that was at the time where they had colonies everywhere. The, the sun never set on the British Empire, made it outlaw, and then for the next like 150 years, the British Empire fought on the high seas to end slavery. And so Wilbur Wilberforce was the person who led that charge, deeply passionate follower of Jesus Christ, who believed that every person was created in the image of God. Um, he wrote a, a book, a fascinating book, called Real Christianity. And he said this, he says, to take the name of Christian, so this is the Christian on Christian, and not cling to Christ. Jesus, so this is the, that's the, that's the, uh, non, uh, the, the non-Christian Christian, the person who, who does the right things, doesn't know Christ. He says, so to take the name of Christian and not cling to Christ, Jesus, is not some uh, it, it, uh, is, uh, let me say it again. To take the name of Jesus, uh, name of Christian, and not cling to Christ. Jesus is not some magic charm to wear like a piece of jewelry we think will give us good luck. He is Lord. His name is to be written on our hearts in such a powerful way that it creates within us a profound experience of his peace peace and a heart that is filled with praise. And he would go on to say, and purpose. So that you're grounded in this love relation with Christ in such a way that you walk and you follow him in every day. You know, I, I, I've been thinking about this message and, and I thought about it in terms of that old thing that, again, the universalists want to say all the time that just basically they want to say, we don't want to make anybody feel bad, so we want to just say every way is just as good. So they say this whole thing, all roads lead to the top of the mountain. Okay? And I always want to ask those folks when they say that, have you ever been on a mountain? Or outside even? Because it doesn't work like that. Most trails, you'll get lost, okay? I've been lost in the woods because I thought I was, I, we, we don't stay on the trail, we can cut it, we'll catch the trail over here. Well, we'll cut this mile off by going there. Don't do that. Don't do that. Well, I imagine going up to this mountain. It's the mountain of life. And I say, okay, 
Life is at the top of this mountain, meaning, purpose, salvation. It's all at the top of the mountain. I got to get to the top of the mountain. And I walk up and there's a guy sitting there and he's a guide. And I say, hey, which one of these trails here leads to the top of the mountain? He says, well, if you look over there, there's a, there's a popular one. And you look over, sure, a big, wide thing. Lots of people. He says, there's hotels there. A lot of partying. They stop every night. They have a great time. It's very, very popular. I said, does that get to the top of the mountain? He says, no, it goes off the edge of a cliff. Very popular, though. It's a lot of people are choosing it. I said, well, what's this group of people over there? He said, oh, that's the group of people who believe there's no such thing as a mountain. What? These are people who believe there's no life. And so what they've decided to do is they're going to make a tower. They're going to make a tower of human achievement and humanism. And they're going to make something great about that and make that meaningful in the shade of the mountain. And you look, you look at the mountain. That's the story of the Tower of Babel in the Old Testament. There's a story where people tried to make a tower to God. My favorite part of that story is that when they're making the tower, they're so proud of it. The Bible says, and God stooped over to look. You know, it's the Bible's way of saying, that's so cute. You know, have you seen my mountains? Have you seen my mountains? You know? And so these are the people who think they don't need God. And they say, well, what about these other kinds of roads? He says, you know, the truth is, every one of these roads but one leads to a swamp, leads off the edge of a cliff, to a dead end, to an avalanche. Every one of them leads, except which one? He says, which one? He says, this one right behind me. You see it? Say, I don't really see it. He says, see that little crack? through those rocks and those trees and not a lot of traffic, says, that's it. Say, that's the passive, yeah, that's the passive. Is it, is it passable? It is passable, but it's hard. Not a lot of people choose it. You know, a lot of people just say, I'm going to find another way. I'm going to have a little Jesus on the side, like salad with a steak. You know, I'm going to, I'm going to just kind of build my life on some other big mission. I'm going, to, I'm going to go the popular way because a lot of people seem to think that's smart, okay? Because um, I've found usually the crowd is usually right about most things. That was cynicism. He says, but here's the deal. You got to go this way. He says, well, will I make it? He says, probably not, unless you have a guide. And he said, I'm the guide. My name's Jesus. He said, and I'm actually the first one to walk up that path. And when I walked up, I carried a cross up that path. And I know the way. And I will bring you if you want to come. But there's a couple things you need to understand about this if we're going to go. So the first thing is, you got to believe in me. You got to believe in who I am and what I stand for in my way. You got to have a kind of radical trust. We got to have a relationship. I mean, there are going to be times where it's rainy, it's cold, I'm going to make you keep going, you're going to be so mad at me. There are going to be other times where you're going to want to go over on this side road just because it looks better, more comfortable, you're just, your heart's in it or whatever, and I'm going to draw you back. There will be other times you fall, and I'm going to let you fall because you made a choice, I'm going to wait for you to get up, I'm going to help you when you're ready to come back. He says, there's going to be times where it's going to be tough, but you've got to trust me. You've got to keep coming back to the fact that I'm a guide, I love you, I'll get you home. He says, the other thing you've got to just understand is you've got to follow me. You've got to do it my way, in my time. He says, Anybody can come, you can come, but you got to do it my way. It's all about a relationship and about my way. He says, if you do that, I will lead you to life. You see, this is what these warning passages are all about. These are not popular, everything's okay, you're good, your way, oh, everything's fine. Jesus could not, ha Jesus did not give us that option. He did not mean to. He did not come to give us life, he came to be our life. He did not come and say, you know what, there's a lot of ways you figure it out. That's not love. Jesus was crystal clear, this is the way. I'm the way, the truth, and life. Follow me, trust me, relation with me, do my way, and that is the way that leads to life. At first, it's hard, but the more you're on the trail, the stronger you'll get, the more significant you'll become. What you become, the journey becomes part of the reward. We'll go through some trials, but I have a way to turn those trials into gold. I actually have a way to use them for good things. See, this is the Jesus way. This is the wisdom way. And the warnings he gives, again, the fact that he ended this with such strong warnings, removes off the table that this is just a good idea, the Jesus way. No, 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 no. This is the only way. And so what I want to do is I want to end in prayer. Um, and I just want to let you know. Um, I don't want to just pray another prayer, a sinner's prayer. Maybe you've done that before. Um, but I want my heart and my words to be your words. This is about a paradigm shift in your life. This is about saying, Jesus, I had you as Jesus on the side. Or I had Jesus' as life coach, health improvement guy. Or I had, you know, um, just the benefits of doing Jesus stuff without really knowing or believing in Jesus. We're going to set all that aside, and we're just going to proclaim Jesus as Lord in our life. Let's pray together. Father, wow, we need you. Not only are you the firm foundation and the solid place to stand, you are the only place to stand. There is not a plan B. There is not a second option. There is not a backup. And we have experienced firsthand 
the crash that happens in our life when we build on sand, we do it our way and our time and our, our way, and, and we just want to reject all that. We want to come back to you, Lord Jesus, and we want to say we need you, we love you, we want to know you. We want to have a relationship with you. We want to talk with you. We want to trust you. We want to learn your ways from your word, and we want to live your ways. We want to see your example on the cross where you went the extra mile. You turned the, extra, you turned the other cheek. You forgave your enemies. You prayed for those who persecuted you. We want to be like that. We want to live that kind of life. We want to do the Jesus way. We want to do the things you've done because we know you and we love you. So show us what it really means to be a Christian, Christian, a person who follows you because we believe in you. Help us to see what real wisdom looks like. We love you. We need you. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.